it is understanding that my purpose is, I hope everybody's purpose, which is to leave the world better than when we found it. Okay. And believing in that fundamental thing that's often quoted that Dr. King said, that the arc of the moral, moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. This is a journey. Let me take you on a journey. There will still be the journey. The journey. New Sheriff in town. The journey. journey. This thing is bigger than Nino Brown. This is the journey. The journey. What is it that moved you? The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. Welcome back to another edition of The Journey. I'm your host, Larry Robinson, and today I guarantee you, my personal guarantee, that we will we have not let you down with today's guest. But before we get to him, let's start with our quote of the day. The beautiful journey of today can only begin when we learn to let go of yesterday. And so that means a lot. And, and I'll get back into why, what that means to me. But in essence, you got to let go of the past yeah. in order to embrace the future. Every day is a new day, so be renewed. So today we have Pastor Rem Doctor <laughs> J. Lawrence Turner. <laughs> Straight out of Nashville, the senior pastor of one of the most storied churches in Memphis, Tennessee, Mississippi Boulevard Christian Church. HBCU raised, the brother went to Fisk, so he's got his balance. He's an Ivy Leaguer too, so he know how to code switch. <laughs> he's a passionate activist, community activist, father, husband, and a proud member of them purple and gold boys. Omega Psi Phi. What's going on, Pastor What's Turner? going on? Glad to be here with Gla you, man. I'm glad to have I'm you. I'm honored. Y'all shoot. I'm not as honored as I am. You know, not every day do you get to interview your pastor. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. So <laughs> now I get to find out where all them uh, bones are buried. <laughs> anyway, so so listen, we're going to start out. We're going to start out. Tell me about your early years. I know that was in Nashville. Yep. Give me a little bit. Yeah. What the family looked like and so on and so forth, yeah. early years in Nashville. So early years in Nashville um, were uh, great years. It, okay. it certainly is not the Nashville okay. that we see today. Right. I grew up in South Nashville, the Edge Hill community. Right. Uh, my father was a pastor. Oh, you was a PK. Uh, yes, I was oh, a PK. Okay. Uh, mom was a PK herself. Oh, wow. Um, and family of PK. Yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> So, so y'all going to see, just, that's what I'm saying, it's coming off of you, and that heathen in me is being exercised. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> okay. I'm the third of three boys okay. born to my parents. Okay. Um, and so. Don't tell me all of them pastors. Yeah. Oh, man, yeah. they done put something in the cereal on these boys. <laughs> it certainly has to be a call, because what we saw, oh, uh, our dad experienced in ministry, it, right. pastoring was the farthest from anything right. we wanted to do. Right. Uh, but God had other, other plans. So outside of your parents, who had the biggest influence on you hmm. as a young person? As a young person, the greatest influence would be people that I probably never met. OK. But who loom large in, in my life and I believe in the world. So you have your Malcolm X's, your, your Martin King's, your really? Adam Clayton Powell, wow. juniors, wow. Um, just people that I just looked up to and uh, wanted to in some way as I continue to grow and mature emulate. Okay. Now you mentioned Malcolm X. You made a pilgrimage to Harlem yet? <laughs> <laughs> I made the pilgrimage to Harlem. Okay, but not to Mecca. <laughs> not okay. to Mecca, no. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. So here's a question for you, and you might have to think a little bit. How different are you from the dreams of your childhood? Mm. I always talk about my early dreams of playing NBA yep. and all yep. those things. Whatever it was, I was going to be yep. rich. So. Yeah. How different are you from the dreams of your childhood? Yeah, I wanted to be a corporate attorney. Really? Yeah, yeah. That that once I realized I wasn't good at math, wasn't good at science, right? <laughs> he said, but, I argue you to death. I, yeah, <laughs> I enjoyed reading. I could okay. recall things. So right. I was like, you know, right. I think I might want to, you know, get into this field of law. Okay. Uh, it's not criminal law. It's you know, really work with corporations and things like that. So I thought that would be. Uh, okay. the path I would take in life. I'd be a part of a church, go to church, right? but I wouldn't be a pastor. When did you get the calling? What age was yeah. that? 16. 16? And, yeah, and I really pushed it off. Wow. 17, I embraced it. So my really? last year in high school. Last year in high school, you knew that you were going to be a pastor. I didn't know if I was going to pass, I, I, had, I had a call to preach. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. So how did you know, or when did you know mm. that you were going to be okay? Everything going to be fine. I'm going to... I'm going to be able to do this thing called life. <laughs> Ooh, life or ministry. See, this well, is, life, life, these life as a whole. Yeah, I, I think 
um, you know, in my formative years. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Growing up in a Brazilian household, right. you kind of, you know, learn how to roll with the punches, whatever's okay. thrown at you. So I would say 12, 13, you got to realize, okay, I'm going to be okay. I okay. think I might know which way I'm headed, although I'm not clear on it. Okay. But yeah, around those ages. Okay. I got something for you. All I got right. a few words, you know, play a little word association. Let's do it. So people kind of get an idea of who Reverend Doctor <laughs> J. Lawrence Turner is. So Reverend Doctor, we got to keep that up. So the first word is focused. Mm. What comes to mind when someone says focused? When people say focused, um, it, it's somebody whose life is aligned. And so okay. that when I hear focused, that's what I think about. Okay. Empowered. Hmm. It's something that we're trying to do for our community. Okay. Gifts. Hmm. Everybody has them. Not everybody uses them. All right. All right. Purpose. Hmm. Find it as quickly as you can. Okay. How'd you find yours? Hmm. I think it was probably more so in college, undergraduate years. Okay. And being challenged to think beyond profession. Beyond profession. But to think about the purpose God put me here. My profession may inform my, my may be a way I live out my purpose. Right. My profession is not my purpose. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, okay. Last but certainly not least, inspired. Mm. Inspiration. One of the greatest feelings I think we can have in life. Really? Yeah. You feel inspired? Yeah. Every day? Yeah. Okay, okay. So that leads me to your why. Mm. Why you get up and do it every day? Why do you fight the good fight? Yeah. What What's driving you? It is understanding that my purpose is, I hope everybody's purpose, which is to leave the world better than when we found it. Okay. And believing in that fundamental thing that's often quoted that Dr. King said, that the arc of the moral, moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Okay. And so I want to help that arc to bend okay. in my lifetime. Do you see, with, I know you're very much in the community, and, 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 and I would call you an activist, with the turmoil that we've come through in the last, I'd say, four to six years, maybe even eight years, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do you see that arc still bending toward justice? Mm. I, I, I think we're in a retrogressive era on okay. some fronts. What do you mean? Unpack that. I feel like we're going, we've at least gone back 40, 50 years or more wow. in terms of the rhetoric, mm -hmm. in terms of many of the actions that have been taken. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't want to get too political, right. but actions that have been taken by conservative lawmakers at the state level um, and their resistance at the federal level. So a lot of the progress that we fought for, that people died for, is in jeopardy. Wow. Wow. So we always ask this question of our brothers. Is there a time in your life where you, you know, a poignant memory of when you were first realized you were a black man? Mm. I don't think there's ever been a... Hold on, hold on for a second. Listen, we're going to be right back <laughs> on the journey. And the Reverend Doctor is going to share with you when he realized that he was a brother. Now, I know it didn't sound like, like everybody else's, so we got to sit tight, hold tight, and we'll be right back on the journey on the Kazookia Network. Kazookian. based in Memphis, but it is international. A new building, an expanded team, new equipment, a new studio, all inside of seven years. The resources that we were able to utilize with Kazookian and their team has been incredible. And our partners at Kazookian has been a large part of our success. One, it's black owned. So we get to tell our own stories in our own way. I'm so proud of the founder, Larry Robinson, and his entire family and all of the team here at Kazookian. We are so proud of their progress that they've made here in Memphis. With social media and the technology we have today, the world is listening. Cut
Kazookian. Check out all your Kazookian favorites now. Download the Kazookian app, available on Android and iOS. Welcome back to the journey. So today we have Pastor Rem Doctor <laughs> J. Lawrence Turner of Mississippi Boulevard Christian Church. And we about to find out a few things. Number one, we know that the PKs got a little something on the side. They, they get in trouble a lot. So we're going to get into all that. But first, we're going to find out. When did you realize you was a brother? I knew I was an African American uh, first grade. Okay. i never forget I was playing with a Caucasian friend okay. in the sandbox, right, at the park. And his kindergarten sister tagged along. Uh-huh. And uh, when she showed up and saw us playing together, she came to him and said, I don't play with brown people. And so it was at that moment, it was like, whoa, okay. She was in kindergarten? Yeah. And I think it revealed. She rained early. Yeah, yeah. Maybe she had been exposed to something that her brother hadn't. Right. Um, And that's the first moment. And now throughout life, I don't think there's a time. Consistent reminder. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let's rewind. Let's go all the way back. Nashville. You sitting at the table. Which now? Which one are you? Are you the youngest? I am the youngest. Okay, so you got three. You got two older siblings. Mm-hmm. Any sisters at all? No just sisters. Three, just three boys. Just three boys. Three boys that all turned out to be pastors. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Well, by the grace of God. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, what what was it like? What was it like? Three boys in Nashville, son pastors. Yeah, I don't know if my parents did it by design or not. Okay. We knew we, w- we were in a Christian home, okay. but it wasn't like the overbearing, strict right. home. I, our parents worked diligently to make our lives as normal as possible. So all the things that homes with, certainly a lot of wrestling and tussling right. among brothers. When we got right. the basketball goal put up in the backyard, okay. a, a lot of backyard basketball right. you know, fights and Who's elbows. Who's the worst? Who's the worst? Who's the most heathenest of the three? PK, I can't throw my brother under there. <laughs> <laughs> See, you got to understand this. I'm the youngest. So everything okay. that could have been done, they did it. Right. So right. by the time I came along, they were like, dude, don't try that. Right. Mom and dad right. already know. Don't do that. <laughs> so I, so I, I, who I pushed I, mom and dad the most? Who pushed the envelope the most of the three? He going to kill me, but it was big brother. <laughs> He was the first one through. He, exper- he experimented everything for us. So was his road to Jericho the most ro- bumpy and rough? <laughs> I'd say so. I think he would say so. Now, when did he accept the calling? At what age do you remember? Uh, I think he was maybe 20, 21. Okay. Um, and, uh, yep, 2021. 20, did you I say, man, you crazy? Yeah. Uh-oh. No way. <laughs> Not you. Did you say? Well, you know, we had, I, we would, like I said, my parents never forced us to go to church. Right. Uh, we just, it was natural for us. Okay. And so he had worked in the church. We'd serve. We'd do yeah. things like that. But we tried to, dad and mom made sure we had balance. Now, during uh, the early years, you being the baby. Mm-hmm. Tell us about a time when it wasn't cool being the baby. <laughs> Just never like summertime. Right. <laughs> it was like mom and dad would kind of let big brother keep me in my middle brother at right. the house. Um, and so I might have I might want to uh, do something like, for example, the Christmas season. Okay. I'm big on Christmas. OK. And my parents had this old you remember the old TVs that uh-huh. sat on the floor. Uh-huh. It had a record player on one right. and the store. Right. So I pull out the old vinyl and <laughs> pl- start playing Christmas music. And my uh-huh. brothers would be like, cut that off. Right. Shut, we don't want to listen to that. So yeah. it was always a hey, dude. You're the little brother. Right. Understand. Right. <laughs> now so you never you never got to make any decisions in it. Oh no. Oh wow. Oh no. Even wow. even when I tried force. <laughs> wow. Tried to fight my way to get my way and that worked. You, you lost all the battles. All the battles, man. <laughs> <laughs> all of them. <laughs> so tell me about a fond memory. Tell me about a memory that that is etched in your brain forever that you just was like, Oh my God, this was great. It was that every summer. Dad made an effort to take us uh, on vacation. So sometimes that would be, of course, Orlando, any family, right? right, is going to hear Orlando. I remember one year in particular driving from Nashville to Memphis because Amtrak didn't run through Nashville. We got on the train in Memphis and took a cross-country trip. 
mm. from Memphis. First, we went up to Chicago, right. and then across to the West Coast, wow. San Francisco, then down to LA, and then back across to Memphis. And it was that intentionality that gave us exposure uh, right. to see uh, the right. world. And so that those are the memories that uh, ah, I relish, okay. that I try to recreate for my kids. That's awesome, that's awesome. Is there a time in your childhood that you look back and, and, and the impact was made on you and your family that you look back and say, you know, man, that, that really changed our course or altered our direction, or hmm. something like that. I, I think um, there was not one moment. Okay. I think it was me seeing the consistency of my parents. Wow. Not only them being loving towards each other and right. allowing us to see what marriage was, right. but it was their discipline Okay. Day in, day out, like uh, who I am today mm -hmm. in terms of time and things like that, mm -hmm. it's because every morning before any of my brothers could get out to bed, dad was up and he had gotten up, he made him a pot of coffee, he had gotten the newspaper, he'd had the news on watching CNN, briefing himself on what's going to happen for the day, right. uh, helping mom get us out the door. Um, and then from there, I, I have the experience, I never rolled the cheese wagon to school. Okay. Uh, I would go out of district. Um, cheese I w wagon being a bus. Yeah, yeah, bus. yeah. yeah. Um, because my parents were intentional to say, well, I don't care where we live. You're going to, my kids are going to go to the best school okay. in, the, in the district. Okay. And that intentionality, I think, helped to shape the trajectory that not only my life, but my brother's lives took as well. Okay. Um, so let's transit into high school. What was high school years like? I mean, so the brothers are probably out of the house at that point. Yeah, I think my freshman year in high school my uh, was my middle brother's senior year okay. in high school, okay. so yeah. So you was the uh, only one at the house? Yeah. What was that like? It was cool, it was fun. Really? Now, you had two older brothers that went to TSU. Yep. So you had to be different. You just said you're gonna go to you're gonna go to Fisk. So why Fisk over TSU? Well, certainly the HBCU experience is at both institutions. You didn't like them homecoming um, at TSU? Hey, you can still get it at Fisk. We're down the street, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I, but in terms of major, I know I was gonna major in religion and philosophy. Okay. Um, Fisk had a strong religion and philosophy department. They didn't have any religion and philosophy. They had some TSU? classes at TSU, but it just wasn't good. Yeah. <laughs> I need I need I didn't want to lose my religion. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Let me. So, so you got the calling in high school. Mm -hmm. So, what was that like? What was like prom and all of those things like being a man of the cloth at such a young age? Oh, I. I <laughs> It, and how did your it, classmates it was, treat you? It was my senior year, so of course it, everybody would then call me Rev, right? Really? <laughs> I was I played high school basketball, okay. uh, so teammates, you know, would treat me that way. Um, but we're cool, and my coach. So you was the point guard and the chaplain. <laughs> I was the team captain, though, right? <laughs> well, and and I mean, I still dated and all that. Went to the prom, so f fairly normal. I just didn't have like the the wild memories that okay, some people okay. have when it comes to high so school. So prom night, you went home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or some went home too. Yeah. <laughs> Man, so we gotta find some dirt on Pastor Turner. <laughs> We I had, told you my brother's messing all up, so I was like, I right, I don't need to veer really? too far. Oh, okay. All right, <laughs> you gonna get, you gotta tell us something now. You gotta, okay, so transitioning from college to mm -hmm. adulthood. Yeah. When did it start getting real? You know, when did you see when did you meet the missus? Right. Your missus. Right. So around the same time, I transitioned from finished Fisk, went to Yale Divinity School. Okay. Never been to New Haven, Connecticut a day in my life. Okay. Uh, I just remember getting in the car one Sunday afternoon, driving as far as I could. Right. Yeah, <laughs> that's a drive. Yeah, it's a drive. Yeah. And getting to New Haven. Okay. And having to, this is the big push to adulthood, having to reestablish myself in a community where nobody knew who I was. Okay. Couldn't lean on my dad's so connections So you got a there. chance to reinvent. I had to reinvent myself, had to establish myself. You know, my decisions, mm -hmm. I had to own them. Right. Um, and interestingly enough, that first year 
in Divinity School mm. is when I met Bridget. Now okay. she was at Fisk. Okay. Um, and she's I, at Fisk too. She, yeah, she was at Fisk, but two years behind me. So um, I, while I was there, I didn't. We didn't meet. Right. When I get to Yale, mm -hmm. while at Yale, they send me back to campus. Okay. To recruit right. students in the religion and philosophy right. department. I had met her uncle. Girl, I got a scholarship. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I met her uncle, uh -huh. and he told me he had a, uh, a, a niece at right. Fisk. Right. So I, I knew I was making a visit. I was like, I'm going to meet his, niece. find out who his niece is. Right. So I get to campus, and uh -huh. I do my thing with the students. I present, you know, the admissions information, all right. that. And right. so I leave, and I head back up towards the chapel. Okay. And everybody's out on the yard, uh -huh. and I talk to one of my homeboys. I say, hey, man. Uh, you know this girl named mm -hmm. Bridget Bush, right? And he like, yeah, man, yeah. Mm -hmm. She actually over there. I was like, man, take me over to her. Okay. And so I roll up on her, and I call her uncle by the wrong name. I'm like, oh, do wow. you know? And uh -huh. she just kind of looks at me. Right. So I put it this way: um, at first attempt, I didn't succeed. <laughs> <laughs> the first impression wasn't the best, huh? <laughs> and it was a few years later. Okay. Um, I was pastoring my first church in New Haven. And she was um, interning at the Bronx DA's office. Wow. And we found, we hooked up there and okay. through a mutual friend, got okay. us together. And from then, we've been together. Wow. Yeah. So you saw, when, when was your first unholy thought? <laughs> I know you can tell us about the unholy part. You looked at her and said, girl, I sopped you up on two biscuits. Hey, come on, wait, wait, come on now. Give no, me something. No, I just said I got a wife her. Huh? <laughs> you got to put a ring Because the marriage bed is under fire. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, so how is Memphis, how has Memphis developed you mm. over these years you've been here? Wow, Memphis is a city that, I mean, we often say it has grit and grind. Yeah. And the, I never forget, I'd been to Memphis before. Okay. But when uh, we were discerning the call to Mississippi Boulevard, right. coming to Memphis and feeling just a sense of possibility. Okay. You know the city has its challenges like right. any city. Right. But still feeling a great sense of possibility and mm -hmm. that possibly the Lord was leading me here mm. to be a part of what the city can be. Okay. Yeah. Because I hope it, I really do believe there's tremendous possibility. Yes. And potential here. Yes. Um, what made Memphis okay? When you, when, you, when you were looking at all the cities you could have possibly gone to, mm -hmm. and I'm sure out of Yale Divinity, I'm sure there was numerous. Mm. What made Memphis that city for you? Hmm. Um, after settling in here, um, mm -hmm. I, even growing up in Nashville, mm -hmm. Memphis is soulful. Yeah. I yeah. mean, you feel it. Yeah, you feel it. When you, when you hit the sick. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And although growing up 199 miles away in Nashville, Nashville doesn't have that soulfulness. Right. Uh, Memphis is a churchy city. People mm -hmm. go to church. Oh, yeah. You know, you might be dope boy on the block, but grandmama going to say you're going to go to church on Sunday morning. Friday night. What yeah. is that? Saturday night, <laughs> Sunday morning. Right. You're right. going to be in church right. Right. on Sunday um, morning. And, and so that those are the kind of things that um, have made uh, me fall in love with this city, the cultural hub that I believe it is. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I'm hopeful okay. for what Memphis is going to become. Good. Yeah. Good. What's your greatest successes while you've been here? Man, I was going to say just getting up <laughs> <laughs> every morning and taking it. I, I think the church has had some successes. My, my uh, prayer when I came mm -hmm. was that God would allow, um, during my tenure, to leverage the influence and resources of Mississippi Boulevard Absolutely. for the benefit of the city. Okay. And I think uh, short of nine years being here, we are doing that. Nine years? Um, yeah. Wow. I think we're doing that. Uh, in what we've contributed to local nonprofits, mm -hmm. uh, in what we've advocated for as a church, right. um, I think, uh, and, and then being able to be a part of those conversations that are making the difference mm -hmm. uh, in our city, I think those have been the successes. Uh, and I can't claim any success apart from what the church has been able to do. Right. Any regrets, anything you do differently mm -hmm. in those nine years? Yeah. Um, as I think about it, man, um, in, in churches of this size, 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nine years, uh, you have to count them in dog years. <laughs> <laughs> So you feeling like it might be 29 yeah. years. <laughs> I, 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 one thing I do regret that I, I think I stood back too long mm. um, and didn't kind of jump into the fray as I've done over the past couple of years. Right. Right. Um, I wanted to be respectful of people I call city fathers or right. uh, people might call them gatekeepers. Right. And I didn't want to overstep. Uh, when did that change? When did you say, you know what, bump that? 38 particularly my 39th birthday, mm -hmm. I said, King and X died at 39. Wow. The Lord has allowed me to make it at 39. I want to make the next 39 years of my life as impactful okay. as they made their lives in 39 years. Talking to your younger self, you're talking to that young man back in Nashville. What would you say to him? Ah, dream big. Okay. And and don't allow your perceived limitations right. to stop you from going after those dreams. Wow. So I think in childhood, even into early adulthood, I was mm -hmm. um, just a little bit, uh, people would say I was shy or just wouldn't you know, jump in. Right. And as I moved more and more into, a, into manhood, right. that kind of rolled away. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wish I would have got that a little bit earlier little bit and earlier. not have been afraid of taking risk right um of course calculated risk okay. but taking risks that might have produced some great results now you guys have a really strong youth program at mm. mississippi boulevard my wife's a big part of that yes she is part Pastor of this. chris watson yes and the, and the folk down there um you're talking to those young men mm -hmm. you're talking to middle school kids mm -hmm. you're talking to young men in the high school age mm -hmm. If you're looking in that camera right there and they were on the other side, what would you leave them with? A Turnerism, a mm. Reverend Dr. Turnerism that you can hold mm. on to. What would you leave them with? Hmm. What would I say to them? I would say uh, to any young man, uh, whether you're in elementary school, middle school, high school, um, is um, to say, find a way or make a way. Uh, life is gonna throw at you many obstacles. They're gonna be, there's gonna be resistance just simply because you're black. Uh, but regardless of what's thrown at you, find a way or make a way. And when you find a way or make a way, make sure it's not unethical, <laughs> immoral, or illegal. Uh, and I'm sure uh, that you will find yourself in a place that you never would imagine you would have been in life. Fantastic, find a way or make a way. That's gonna be the mantra of this episode <laughs> of The Journey. Find a way or make a way, as long as it's not unethical. Listen, I'm your host, Larry Robinson, for the Reverend Dr. <laughs> J. Lawrence Turner. We want to thank you for watching the journey. Listen, come back, because we're going to keep bringing them. These people, you have to get a chance to know their greatness and know that they've fallen down, they've skinned their knees, but they've fallen down seven times and they've gotten up eight. So listen, to the next time, Larry Robinson, take care. To hear more incredible stories like this, be sure to download the Kazookian app from the App Store or Google Play, or check out the Journey Memphis podcast on all your major podcast providers. Also, check us out on the Kazookian Network. <laughs>